frightened by trifles. Yes, all is in a man's hands, yet he lets it slip through cowardice. That's what men are most afraid of. Taking a new step, uttering a new word. I'm talking too much. I've learned to chatter this last month, lying for days in my den, thinking of Jack the Giant Killer. But am I capable of that? No, it's a fantasy plaything to amuse myself, nothing more. If I'm so scared now, how will I be if it somehow came to pass that I were really going to do it? How much? You come with such a jump, dear. It's scarcely worth anything. I gave you two rubles last time for your ring. Oh, goodbye, quietly, but did you do this for a ruble and a half? Give me four, of course. I shall redeem it. It was my father's. A ruble and a half a with interest in advance. Interest in Take advance. it or leave it. A ruble and a half? Suit yourself. Wait. All right. Hand it over. Ten kopecks a ruble per month. So I must take fifteen kopecks from a ruble and a half for the month in advance. But for the two rubles I lent you before, you now owe me twenty kopecks. That makes thirty-five kopecks. So I must give you a ruble and fifteen kopecks for the watch. Here it is. What? Only a ruble and fifteen kopecks now? Just so. Are you always alone, Aliona Ivanovna? Your sister is a Vieta. What business is she of yours, dearie? Well, nothing. nothing. None. None. Simply curious. I may bring you something in a day or two. Valuable for you. Silver. As soon as I get it back from a friend. Well, we'll talk about it then. Miserable old hag! God, how loathsome it all is! And can I, can I possibly? No, it's all nonsense. How could such an atrocious thing come into my head? What filthy things my heart is capable of. Yes, filthy, above all loathsome. And for a whole month I've been... I live, I live, just through the wall, just through the wall from here. I went to a school for the daughters of noblemen and danced the shawl dance before the governor. Let me drink even the certificate of merit. It is in my trunk still. Do you think a poor girl can make much money from honest work? And there were the little ones hungry. I said, you live with us and you do nothing to help. You do nothing to assist me. Am I ready to do a thing like that? And what do I say? I say, and why not? What are you guarding? Some treasure? Six o'clock, Sonia puts on her shawl and goes out of the room. And at nine o'clock, she comes back again. She lays 30 rubles on the table before me. And then she lies on the bed, with her face to the wall, and her body shuddering. And I kissed her feet. I kissed her feet. And all the time he lay there drunk. Five days ago, like a thief in a night, he rose and he rose and stole the key to my trunk. There were twelve rubles left in that trunk. And where is the Shade. 
Will you forgive my Sonia? Will you say, come to me, my child? Thy sins are forgiven thee, for thou hast loved much. The Marmalado. Will you forgive him where I cannot? Will you say, come forth, ye drunkards, ye weak ones, ye children of shame? Will you hold out your hands to him? Life I could begin anew. What things, what things I then would do. A heavy sleep and sweet awakening. <coughs> Let him amuse himself. It's not for me to interfere. Let him devour her alive. What's it to me? Poor girl. Or what does it matter? A certain percentage, they tell us, must go to the devil so the rest may remain chaste. Percentage. What splendid words they have. So scientific, so consolatory. Once you said percentage, there's nothing else to worry about. What if do we, for one of the percentage? Oi! Get up! Why are you sleeping? You're always sleeping. It's past midday. Are you ill? I brought you some tea. Will you have a cup? I should think you're fairly starving. From the landlady, eh? From the landlady, indeed. Will you have some soup? It's capital soup. Yesterday's. I saved it for you yesterday, but you come in late. It's fine soup. Soup? Yes. Why not? Soup. What a stupid thing to do when I needed it myself. Still, the lady wants for Martin too. Such smartness costs money. And maybe Sonia herself will be bankrupt today, for there is always a risk digging for gold. Hurrah for Sonia! What a mine they've dug there, and they're making the most of it. They've wept and grown used to it. A man grows used to everything. A scoundrel! But what if I'm wrong? What if man is not really a scoundrel? Man in general, I mean. And all the rest is prejudice, simply artificial terrors. And there are no imperatives, and it's all as it should be. Sofia Pavlovna means to complain to the police about you. The police? What for? The rent, that's what. Seeing as you will neither pay up nor depart the premises, the lady in question is considering her options. Oh, the devil. That would not suit me just now. She's a fool. I'll speak to her today. Fool she is, and no mistake. I'd have kicked you out long ago. Thanks. No bother. But why, if you're so clever, do you lie here like a sack and have nothing to show for it? You used to go out, teach kids. Don't do anything anymore. Don't even study. I'm doing... What? 
Work. What sort of work? Thinking. You made much money from thinking. Well, I pay so little for lessons. What's the use of a few kopecks? You want to make a fortune all at once, do you? Yes. I want a fortune. Well, don't be in such a hurry. You've time enough, I hope. Oh, I almost forgot. This come for you yesterday. A letter? From whom? Give it to me for God's sakes, Nastasia! Nastasia, leave me in peace. Aren't you going to have your soup? Later. Now go! My dear Rodia, it's two months since we last spoke by letter. But I'm sure you will not blame me for my inevitable silence. You know how we love you. Know how we love you. You're Do all you know? we have. All we have. All we have. All we have. Our one hope. Our one hope. Mother. I have some news, dear one. Your sister is to be married. To whom? Piotr Petrovich Lucia. He's a well-to-do, dependable man who has two posts in the government and has already made his fortune. Why does Dunya not write and tell me this herself? She cannot write anything just now, but she bids me send you her love and innumerable kisses. How did this come about? It began with Mr. Luzhin expressing through Martha Petrovna, you know, Mr. Svidrigailov's wife, his desire to make our acquaintance. He was properly received, drank coffee, and the very next day he made an offer by letter and begged for a speedy answer. The next day? He is a very busy man and is in a great hurry to get to Petersburg. He plans to open a legal firm there. So you see, dearest one, he may be of the greatest use to you. And Dunya and I have agreed that from this day forward you may consider that your future is assured. Oh, if this only comes to pass, Dunya is dreaming of nothing else. I see. You are aggrieved, I know, because the matter has been arranged without your consent. But we could not postpone our decision till we heard from you. Surely you understand. Of course, Mother. Pyotr Petrovich is such a busy man that even his wedding must be post-haste. Beware, Roger, of judging him too hastily. Pyotr Petrovich is a thoroughly estimable man. At his first visit, indeed, he told us that although he considers himself a practical personage, still he shares many of the convictions of our most rising generation, and is an opponent of all prejudices. It's true that he is over fifty years old, but he is of a fairly prepossessing appearance and might still be considered attractive. Of course, there's no great love on either side, but Dunya is a clever girl and is ready to put up with a great deal. I... Go on. I must admit that he struck me at first as rather abrupt. During his second visit, for instance, he declared that before making Dunya's acquaintance, he had made up his mind to marry a poor girl because, ideally, a wife should feel beholden to her husband and not the other way around. He did strike me as somewhat rude, but in spite of that, he seems kind. I know what you want me to say. Bitter is the ascent to Golgotha. So, he seems kind, does he? That seems beats everything. What a hook to hang a marriage on. Seems! The most joyful piece of news, dear Roger, I have kept till last. It is settled that Dunya shall come to Petersburg, exactly when, I don't know. But Pyotr Petrovich is anxious to have the ceremony as soon as possible. <coughs> Dunya is all excitement at the joyful thought of seeing you. She said she would marry Pyotr Petrovich for that alone. It was a joke, of course. I shall send you as much money as I can in a day or two. Now that everyone has heard of the engagement, my credit has suddenly improved. So I shall be able to send you twenty-five, or even thirty roubles. Rodia, you are everything to us. If only you are happy, we shall be happy. I embrace you warmly, warmly, with many kisses. Let my life go to hell. If only my dear ones be happy. It's all Rodia, precious Rodia, her firstborn. Dunya can put up with a great deal, certainly. So now they've decided she can put up with Mr. Luzhin. Well, I don't want your sacrifice, Dunya. I won't have it, and Luzhin be damned! What are you going to do to prevent it? You are living off them, do you understand? They borrow on their hundred rubles pension. They borrow from the Svidrigailovs. How are you going to save them? 
with it. The day after it, 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 everything will begin anew. But is it really going to happen? Can it be that I shall really take an axe? That I shall strike on the head? Split the skull open? Tread in the wall? Sticky blood? Break the lock? Steam? Tremble? Hide? Good God, can it be? Well, I couldn't wait. I couldn't. Why? Why then am I still? Well, it did knock. What a cabin is this? As hard up as all that? Why, Roger, my friend, you've cut me off. How do you mean? Is it you? <laughs> Don't you lock up? Never. Happy are they who have no need of locks. You look tired. Are you sick? No. Don't! I don't want anything. Do you hear? No one's services, no one's sympathy. Leave me alone. Not like this alone. Let me help you. Listen, I know. I've got two German papers to translate for money. You could do one. Then. I don't want translation. What the devil do you want? I confound you then. Wait. Have you heard of Eliana Ivanovna? You can always get money from her, and she's not above taking a pledge for a ruble. I must warn you, though, she's a bit of an old harpy. She has this half sister, Lizaveta, whom she treats like a slave and beats within an inch of her life. There's a phenomenon for you. What I hear, the old bat's already made her will, and would you credit it? All the money is to be left to a monastery that prayers might be said for her in perpetuity. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Lizaveta is unmarried and uh, rather unusual looking. She has these long feet like this, and she's six foot tall, but she's continually with child. I mean, she looks like a soldier dressed up, but she has such a good-natured face and eyes. Striking me, sir. And a smile. Poor gentle creatures, their gentle eyes, alive only with a slow burn mania of self-sacrifice. I'm sorry, my friend. I thought to amuse you. I should have come sooner. I'll look in again tomorrow. Is it a coincidence that he should have mentioned her? How many good deeds could be done on that old bitch's money which would otherwise be buried in the monastery? Hundreds, thousands perhaps, might be set on the right path. Saved from destitution, from vice, and all with her money. What value has the life of that stupid ill-natured woman in the balance of existence? No more than a louse. Less, in fact, because she is doing actual harm. She's worrying out the lives of others. Enough. I must resolve.
past two o'clock. Out of sight, and the purse too. My God, what's the matter with me? Is that hidden? Is that the way to hide things? Yes, yes. I have not taken the loop off the armhole. I forgot it. A piece of evidence like that. Pieces of torn linen couldn't rouse suspicion. I think not. I think not anyway. Oh, God help me. There's blood on the purse too. Then there must be blood in the pocket for I put the wet purse in there. What's the matter with me? Surely it's not beginning already. My punishment coming upon me. It is. There are no matches. No. Better go out and throw it all away somewhere. Yes, I throw it away at once. This minute. Without hesitating. gentleman, I think. Nastasia. Why were they beating the landlady? What do you mean? Just now on the stairs. Nastasia! It's the blood. What blood? No one's been beating the landlady. I heard it. I wasn't asleep. Everyone ran out onto the stairs. No one's been here. It's the blood crying in your ears. When there's no outlet for it, it gets clotted and you start fancying things. Can I get you something to eat? You've had nothing since yesterday, I bet. God, look at you. You're shaking with fever. Get me something to drink, Nastasia. Dr. Petrovich Luzin. I have reason to hope my name is not only unknown to you. Can it be you have received no information? I had presumed and calculated that a letter posted more than ten days ago. Your mamma. Your mamma had commenced a letter to you while I was sojourning in her neighbourhood. I had purposely allowed a few days to elapse before coming to see you, in order that I might be fully assured that you were in complete possession of the tidings. But now, to my astonishment... Oh, for God's sake, I know. You're the fiancé. 
I know, and that's enough. I am expecting your sister at any moment. I have secured a room for her. Where? Very near here. Back of Laev's house. A disgusting place. Filthy, stinking and a doubtful character. It's cheap though. I could not of course find out so much about it, being a stranger to Petersburg myself. However, the room is exceptionally clean and as it is for so short a time, I have already taken a permanent, that is to say our future, flat and I'm having it done up. In the meantime, I myself am cramped for room in a lodging with my friend Andrei Lebeziatnikov. Lebeziatnikov? Yes, Andrei Simeonich Lebeziatnikov, a clerk in the ministry. Do you know him? No. Excuse me, I, I fancied so from your inquiry. I was once his guardian. Very nice young man and quite advanced. It's my belief that one can learn most from watching the younger generation. In what way? No, in the most serious and essential matters. It's ten years since I visited Petersburg. All the novelties, the uh, reforms, ideas have reached us in the provinces, but to see it all with clarity, one must be in Petersburg. And I confess, I am delighted. With what? Oh. For one thing, I fancy I find clearer views. More, shall we say, critical analysis. More practicality. <laughs> of course, uh, people do get carried away and make mistakes, but one must be indulgent. New and valuable ideas and works are circulating in place of our old dreamy and romantic uh, authors. Uh, literature is taking a maturer form. Many injurious prejudices are being rooted out and exposed to ridicule. In short, we have cut ourselves off irrevocably from the past, and that, to my thinking, is a great thing. Windbag. Eh? Hitherto, for example, if I were told, Love thy neighbour, what came of it? Well, I expected to tear me coat enough to share with him, and then we'd both be left out naked. Science now tells us, keep your coat whole. Love yourself above all. For everything in the world depends on self-interest. Economic truth adds that the better private affairs are organised in society, the firmer are its foundations. The idea is simple. Unhappily, it's been a long time reaching us, being hindered by idealism, uh, sentimentality. Enough! Enough! I trust our acquaintance will, upon your recovery and in view of the circumstances of which you are aware, become closer. Above all, I hope for your return to health. Oh. Your mamma is sent, as entrusted to my care. Thirty rubles. Thirty-five rubles. I don't want it. What? I don't want the money. Carry out logically the theory you were advocating just now, and it follows that people may be killed. Upon my word. And is it true that you told your fiancé, within an hour of her acceptance, that what pleased you the most was that she was a beggar? And, I paraphrase somewhat, the idea of her being beholden to you just had you wriggling all over with delight. Upon my word! To, to distort my words in that way! In a word, this arrow! In a word, your mama. Oh, she seemed to me of a, of a somewhat high-flown and romantic way of thinking, but I was a thousand miles from supposing she would misrepresent things in so fanciful a way, and, 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 and indeed... Tell you what! I tell you what. What? If you ever speak of my mother in that way again, I shall send you flying downstairs! I can forgive a great deal in a sick man and a connection, but you, never after this. I so much the word! Go to hell! I'm not afraid of you! I'm not afraid of anyone, anyone anymore! Get away from me! I want to be alone! 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 What is it? 
What do you want? Why do you come here and say nothing? What's the meaning of it? Murder. What do you mean? Who is a murderer? You. tracks. No one would think of looking under that stone. It's over. Thank God. But if it's all really been done deliberately and not idiotically, how is it I didn't even glance into the purse and have no idea what was in there? Why, I nearly threw everything into the canal. How's that? It's because I'm very ill. I have been worrying fretting myself. Yesterday, and the day before yesterday, and all this time. I shall get well, and I shall not worry. But what if I don't? Good God, how sick I am of it all! his dinner later. Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? Who is the man that sprang from the earth? What did he see? What did he see? Fly he see? by his or Is it possible? Is it possible? And how dared I? How dared I? Knowing myself. Knowing how I should be. Master to whom all things permitted. Storms to love. Makes a massacre of Paris. Gets an army in Egypt. Wastes half a million men in Moscow. And gets off with a jest at Vilna. Yet monuments are built in his honor. No, such people are not. It seems of flesh. But of bronze. Skin. Stinking old crap. Loathsome, 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 loathsome. A Napoleon creep under a crab's bed. Louse! Killing principles. Killing principles. Overstep. But I didn't overstep. I stopped. I stopped. No. Life is only given to me once. And I shall never have it again. Poor Lizavieta. Why did she have to come in? Sonia, poor gentle creatures with their gentle eyes. Why don't they weep? Why don't they moan? They give up everything. I have given up everything. Her eyes are soft and gentle. Sonia, Sonia, gentle.
Who the hell is this, Nastasia? He is himself again. Bravo, he is himself. It's a good job you've come too, brother. You were out four days. We had to feed you tea in spoonfuls. I brought Zazimov to see you twice. He remembers Zazimov. He examined you carefully and said at once it was nothing serious. Some nervous nonsense. But it will pass and you will be all right. And now, brother, are you hungry? Yes. <laughs> is there any soup? Some of yesterday's. With potatoes and rice in it? Yes. <laughs> I know it by heart. Bring soup, sweet lady. And uh, give us some tea. Very well. Oh, wait! It would not be amiss, Nastasia, if Kraskopia Pavlovna were to send us up a couple of buckets of beer. We could empty them. Well, you are a cool hand. Was it you I didn't recognise when I was delirious? Yes, you flew into a rage about it. Did I say anything in delirium? I didn't think so. You were beside yourself. What did I rave about? What did you rave about? What do people usually rave about? What did I rave about? Oh, it keeps on. Don't worry! You said nothing about a countess. You just muttered a bit about earrings and some special sock. You whined, give me my sock, until Nastasia and I found the requisite rag. And for the next 24 hours you held the wretched thing in your hand. We couldn't get it from you. Nastasia, my dear, will you have some beer? Get along with your nonsense. Cup of tea, then. A cup of tea, maybe. Pour it out. No, wait, I'll do it. Sit down. Pashinka must give us some raspberry jam today. Make him some raspberry tea. Where's she going to get raspberries from for you? <laughs> Why don't you put your sugar in your tea, Nastasia Nikiforovna? <laughs> you are a one. But I'm not Nikiforovna, but Petrovna. I'll make a note of it. <clears throat> oh, pulse is first rate. How's your head? I am well. I am perfectly well. Good! Tomorrow evening I'll take you for a walk. We'll go to the Yusupov Garden and to the Palais de Cristal, but for now, rest. I'll stay in... Oh, what a nuisance. I've got a housewarming party tonight. It was only a step from here. Well, you could come, lie on the sofa. Better than staying alone here. Tea, vodka, herrings, there will be a pie. Just friends. My new neighbours here, almost all new friends, except my old uncle. And he's new too. He only arrived in Petersburg yesterday. And then there's Porfiry Petrovich, the head of the investigation department. By the way, Roger, you'll have heard already, I suppose. It happened before you were ill. The murder of the old pawnbroker. Porfiry Petrovich, is he? Elizabetta was murdered too. I know. Who would murder Lizavieta? Lizavieta. Lizavieta, who sold old clothes. She used to come here. She mended a shirt for you once, don't you remember? With an axe. They think it was one of her customers killed her. <laughs> Not a doubt of it. As I was saying, Porfiry Petrovich is heading up the case. He doesn't give his opinion, but he told me they're investigating anyone who left pledges with her. Investigating? Yeah. How does he get hold of them? There are names on the wrappers of the pledges. Some have come forward of themselves. It must have been a cunning practice ruffian did it. The boldness of it. The coolness. Oh, that's just what it wasn't. Well, he didn't know how to rob. He could only murder. He took jewels worth ten or twenty rubles, ransacked the old woman's trunks, her rags. Porfiry says they found fifteen hundred rubles left behind in a box in the top drawer of the chest. It was his first crime, I assure you. He lost his head. Got off more by luck than judgment. How do you mean? This is what I think happened. And it's pure conjecture, but a jewel case points to it. What jewel case? The murderer dropped a pair of earrings. He was upstairs. How do you know it was a he? The murderer was upstairs, locked in the old woman's room, when Mrs. Koch and Pistrakov knocked at the door. Who? Witnesses. Though it seems they saw nothing. They had an appointment with the old woman, you see. Well, they knocked and knocked, but there was no answer. So then, like perfect asses, both of them went downstairs together to get the porter. 
So the murderer seized the opportunity to run out of the flat and down the stairs, for he had no other means of escape. He hid from Coffin Strachan and the porter in an empty flat where the painters had finished for the day. It was there, you see, behind the door, that the jewel case containing the earrings was found. Lying behind the door. Behind the door. Behind the door. Yes. Why, what's wrong? Nothing. What next? Well, that's it, really. I think he waited there and then went quickly downstairs when the coast was clear. The earrings must have fallen out of his pocket as he stood behind the door. Only he didn't notice because he had well, other things to think of. That's how I explain it. Too clever. No, my boy, you're too clever by half. But why? Why? Because everything fits too well. It's too melodramatic. What a jolly life you lead. Do you understand, my friend, what it means when you have absolutely nowhere to turn? Because everyone must have somewhere to turn. Where was it I read that a man condemned to death thinks that if he had to live instead on some high, narrow ledge with only a square yard of space to stand upon, and the ocean, everlasting darkness, everlasting solitude around him for all eternity. It were better to live so, than to die at once. Only to live, to live and live. Life, whatever it may be. How true it is. Good God, how true. Man is a vile creature, and vile is he who calls him vile for that. Do you find me curious? Delirious. Drink your beer. What? Yeah. There have been a great many crimes lately. Only the other day I read that old gang of forties had been caught in Moscow. Oh, but that was ages ago. A group of simpletons. And the man who changed the notes took 5,000 roubles and his hands trembled. He counted the first 4,000, but not the fifth. He was in such a hurry to get the money into his pocket and run away. So naturally he roused suspicion, and the whole thing came to a crash through one fool. Is it possible? But his hands trembled. Yes, it's quite possible. Sometimes one can't stand things. Can't stand that? Why, could you? For the sake of a hundred roubles, to walk with false notes into a bank where it's their business to spot that sort of thing? I shouldn't have the nerve to do it, would you? I would. Fool, what terrible thing you say. That's only talk. I believe that even a practised, desperate man can't always count on himself, much less you or I. Well, take the old pawnbroker again. The murderer seems to have been a desperate fellow. He risked everything, escaped by a miracle, but his hands shook too. That's clear from him. Clear? Why don't they catch him then? Well, they will. Who? Oh, you? You've a tough job. A man will risk his life to commit some elaborate crime and goes drinking in a tavern. He's caught spending the money. You wouldn't go to a tavern, of course. Would you like to know what I should do? I should. Very much? Very much. All right, then. I would have taken every last kopeck and gone to some deserted place with fences round it. Some kitchen garden or other. I'd have sought out beforehand a stone weighing a hundred pounds which had been there since the house was built. I'd lift that stone. There'd be sure to be a hollow beneath it and I'd put the jewels and money into that hole. Then I'd roll the stone back just as it was before, push it down with my foot and walk away for a year, maybe three, I wouldn't touch it. And well, they could look. There'd be no trace. <laughs> You're a madman. And what if it was I murdered the old woman and there's a Vieta? What? See, what a lot of money. Where did I get it? Where did my new shirt come from? You know I hadn't a kopeck. Not yet. Oh no. You believed it? Yes, yes, you did! Not a bit. I believe it even less now. Then you did believe it, if now you believe it less than before. Not at all! What you, what's the meaning of this? It means that I am sick to death of you and want to be alone! Alone? Listen, Resume. Can't you see I don't want the burden of your benevolence? How can I persuade you not to persecute me with your kindness? I may be ungrateful, I may be cruel, only let me be. 
for God's sake, let me be, let me be, let me be! Listen to me, will you? Come round tonight. The Jinkum's house, first story. I'll give you a snug easy chair, my landlady had one. A cup of tea. Company. That's what you need. That's all you need. Will you come? Why, Mr. Resumehan? I do believe you'd let anybody beat you from sheer benevolence. Beat? Twist his nose off first. I won't come. I bet you will. I refuse to know you if you don't. Pachinko's house, Babushkin's flat. Remember. What's the matter with you? I'm going. Rude. and trampled him worse. had long belonged to another. Oh, the young man brought him in and laid him on the sofa. Chuck in their carriages, a quick glance under the wheels and then on to the next. And this young man, oh hey, you can say, oh hey. His whole chest was crushed. Blood, blood from the corners of his mouth. What am I to do with my little ones? Support of us. I would not even look to you for help. You brought us nothing but misery. You wasted their lives and mine. And thank God he's dead. One less to keep. My Sonia in the doorway in her shame. He wakes and calls out to her. Sonia, daughter, forgive. Forgive? That's words. If he'd not been run over, he'd have come home drunk as usual and fallen asleep like a log. And the young man. In blood. Your husband loved and respected you, he says to me, in spite of his unfortunate weakness, and he gives me twenty rubles. You're covered in blood, is all I can say to him. Yes, I'm covered in blood, he says, and goes. Strangely, life turns out. Blood. Innocent this time. Not her blood, I mean. Innocent. Indolent, a matter of words and perspectives. Sonia. Sonia with her flame coloured feather. <laughs> and my servant, Rodion! Oh, I was ready to live in a square of space. Enough. I've done with fancies. Imaginary terrors. The kingdom of heaven to you, madam. Leave me in peace. Now for the reign of reason and might, and will and might. Now we shall see, we shall try our strength. By the by, Pachinkov's house is only a few steps from here. I certainly must go to Razumihin. Let him win his bet. Strength. Strength is what one wants. You can get nothing without it. And strength must be won by strength. That's what they don't know. Where's he meeting? Where's he meeting? What? Who is it? 
Why, it's you, Raskolnik of my brother. I knew you'd come. I knew it. What are you doing down there? Listen, I've only just come to say that no one really knows what may happen to him and that you've won your bet. I won't come in. I'm very weak. And so good evening and goodbye. Come and see me tomorrow. Wait, 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 wait. I'll see you home. You say you're weak? But your guests. Oh, I'll leave Uncle with him. He's an invaluable person. It's a pity I can't introduce him. Ah! Hang them all anyway. I need a bit of fresh air. They're talking such a lot of wild stuff you can't imagine. <laughs> Although why shouldn't you? Ah! 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 A little drunk, brother. <laughs> you know, you frightened me today. <laughs> you nearly went into convulsions. You, you, you almost convinced me of the truth of all that hideous nonsense, and then you stuck out your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, poor Fury wants to make your acquaintance. What? Why? Oh, he has some oh, yeah. idea, but don't mind him. Listen, Razumi, I've just been at the deathbed of a clerk named Marmaladov. I gave away all of my money to his wife and children. In fact, I saw someone there with a flame cut. What? Nothing. Support me. I'm very weak. Flame. Flaming. Flamsa. Flamsa! What's the matter? What's the matter with you? Look. What's that? Look. Look. What is it? A light in my room. See. Nastasia, perhaps? She's never in my room at this time and... Oh, fuck it. Goodbye. What do you mean? I'm coming with you. I know you are. What's the matter with you, Rod, here? It's nothing. Come along. You should be witness. Rod, here. What's the matter with him? I'm his sister. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's only a, a slight faint. See, he's coming too. There, see? Go home with him till tomorrow. Tomorrow, everything. When did you arrive? This evening. But I won't leave you, Roger. I'll spend the night here. Don't torture me. I'll stay with him. I won't leave him for a moment. Enough. I won't have it. Go away. I'm distressing him. That's evident. Stay. You keep interrupting me and my ideas get muddled. Have you seen Eugene? No, but he knows already of my arrival. I have heard, Roger, that Pyotr Petrovich visited you. So he did. We had a little chat and I told him to go to hell. I know. Dunya, I don't want that marriage. You are marrying Lucian for my sake and I won't have it. You will write a letter before tomorrow to refuse him. Let me read it in the morning and that will be the end of it. I will do no such thing. What right have He's you to tell me? or how would he dare? This marriage is an infamy. Let me act like a scoundrel, but you mustn't. I won't own such a sister. It's me or Lucian. Now go! Oh, but you're out of your mind, desperate! Oh. Razumihin! Escort Dunya home. Dunya, this is my friend Razumihin, and he is a good man. Listen, I, I, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask Nastasia to sit with him while I escort you home. Y you can't be in the streets alone. But Petersburg is an awful place in that way. Then I'll run straight back here, and after a quarter of an hour, on my Honour, I will bring you news of how he is. Then, listen, then I will run home in a twinkling. I've lots of friends there, all drunk. I'll fetch the Seamoth, that's the doctor that's looking after him. Well, he, he's there too, <laughs> but, but he's, he's not drunk. He, he's never drunk. I'll, I'll drag him to Rodia. If there's anything wrong, I swear I will bring you to him myself. But if it's all right, you go to bed and I will spend the night here in the hallway. Come along, do you trust me? Do you trust me or not? I do. I believe you will do what you have promised. Oh, you see? You understand me because you are an angel. <laughs> so you think I'm in a real state? Nonsense! That is, I am drunk like a fool, but not on wine. Seeing you has turned my head. Don't mind me, I'm talking nonsense. The minute I've taken you home, I'll pour a couple of pailfuls of water over my head, and then I'll be all right. Only you knew how I love you. You 
reason to fall out of heaven. Don't laugh. Don't be angry. You may be angry with anyone, but not with me. I am his friend. Therefore, I am your friend too. I want to be. I expect I won't sleep all night. Zasimov was afraid that he might go mad. That, that's why he mustn't be irritated. Tell me what you think. Forgive me, I don't know your first name. Dmitri Prokofitch. I should very much like to know, Dmitri Prokofitch, how Roger looks on things in general now. That is to say, what are his likes and dislikes? Is he always so irritable? I had not expected to find him like this. Well, naturally. My uncle comes every year and every time he can scarcely recognise me. I've known Roger for a year and a half now. He is morose, haughty, and of late he's been suspicious and fanciful. He's a noble nature and a kind heart that doesn't like showing his feelings. And he would rather do a cruel thing than open his heart freely. He says he's so busy that everything is a hindrance, yet he lies in bed all day and does nothing. He never listens and is completely uninterested in other people. He thinks very highly of himself and perhaps he's right too. Oh, what else? I believe your arrival will have the most beneficial influence upon him. Thank you for your impartiality, Dmitry Prokofitch. And there I was thinking you were too uncritically devoted to him. <laughs> I think you are right, though. He needs a woman's care. I didn't say so, but I dare say you're right. Only... What? He loves no one and perhaps never will. You think he is incapable of love? Do you know, I've done you a man of me. You are awfully like your brother in every way indeed. <laughs> oh, oh, it would have been better if you'd come tomorrow. Then I shouldn't have been drunk. What was it made me get so tight? It was because they made me get into an argument. Damn them. I've sworn never to argue. Would you believe they insist on the complete absence of individualism? Oh, if only a nonsense were their own, but as it is. Talk nonsense. But talk your own nonsense and I will kiss you for it. And what are we doing now? In, in science, uh, development, thought, invention, ideas, aims, judgment, experience, and everything, everything, everything. We're still in the preparatory class at school. We prefer to live on the ideas of others. It's what we're used to. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Yes, although I don't agree with you in everything. <laughs> you say yes. Give me your hand. And that one. I want to kiss both your hands here at once on my knees. Get up. Get up. Not for anything until you let me kiss your hands. That's it. Enough. I get up and we'll go on. I am a luckless fool. I am not worthy of loving you. But to do homage to you is the duty of any man who is not a perfect beast. And so... You are betrothed. And Roger believes your fiancé to be a scoundrel. What, what, what brothers are up to. Well, that, that is, if you of your own free will, well, well, well then I... No, 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 Roger has no right knowing nothing of your mutual relations and next to nothing of the man himself. Dmitry Prokofitch, Pyotr Petrovich promised to meet me at the station. Did you know that? But instead he sent a servant. Do you know... Last night I dreamt of Marfa Petrovna. She was all in white. She came up to me, took my hand, and shook her head at me. Oh, but you don't know, Dmitri Prokofitch, that Marfa Petrovna's dead. Oh, I didn't know, I'm sorry. Who is Marfa Petrovna? She died suddenly. But you don't know who Marfa Petrovna is, and, and for some reason I was thinking that you knew all about me. Forgive me. Dmitry Prokofitch, I must be tired. What's the matter with your right hand? Uh, Have you hurt it? Yeah, I've bruised it. Will you tell me about that? She is, was, the one who first arranged the meeting between myself and Pyotr Petrovich, Mr. Spidrigailov's wife. I worked as a governess in their house. I... How do I begin? Well, to tell you briefly, I received a hundred roubles in advance when I took up the position, on condition of part of my salary being deducted every month. So it was impossible for me to leave, when I needed to, and then Roger needed the money. When you needed to? Yes. You see, although Marfa Petrovna was always kind and generous to me, 
Mr. Svidrigailov was, from the very beginning, deeply disrespectful, especially when... How do I put this? When under the influence of Bacchus. I half wish that I had not begun to tell this. Go on, please. Well, it transpired later on that he had conceived a passion for me and endeavoured to conceal it under a show of rudeness and contempt. Possibly he was ashamed, I don't know. But after several months, he lost all control. He offered to give up everything for me. Indeed, he wanted me to go away with him, to go abroad. I had six weeks left before I could leave his employ on account of that debt, but, but even if I could have, I would not have left straight away. For Martha Petrovna's suspicions would have been aroused, I'm sure, and I hope to spare her. What happened? Martha Petrovna overheard her husband pleading with me in the garden one afternoon, and believed me to be the cause of it all. I shall never forget her face. She struck me. Wouldn't listen. She gave orders that I should be sent home at once in a peasant's cart, and flung all of my clothes, all of my linen, and me into it. I wonder why shame is of all kinds of suffering the hardest to bear. For a month the town was full of gossip. All of our acquaintances avoided us. No one even bowed to us in the street. Mother became ill and I was at my wit's end when, by God's mercy, our sufferings were cut short. Mr. Svidrigailov repented and, and laid before Martha Petrovna the truth of the situation. He even produced a letter that I had written to him long before the incident in the garden, reproaching him for the baseness of his behaviour. Oh, Martha Petrovna was completely taken aback. And at once, without any delay, she took my letter round every house in town, and everywhere asserted my innocence. And why, I wondered, did I tell you all that? Come, I must lead you to your lodgings. And for those alone, Roger was right in driving your fiancé away. Nastasio, fly upstairs with the light and sit with Roger. I'll be back in a quarter of an hour. He is well, quite well. Yes, I see myself that I am perfectly well. This has been coming on a long while, eh? Confess. It's very possible. He said nothing from me but trouble and insult. <laughs> Nonsense. You're in a sentimental mood today. What was I going to say? Oh, yes. Dunia, I did an unpardonable thing yesterday. I was literally out of my mind. I chanced upon a man who had been run over. Marmaladov was his name. A clerk, I believe. I gave away all the money Mother sent me to his wife for the funeral. She's a widow now, in consumption. Three little children, starving, nothing in the house. There's a daughter, too. Perhaps you would have given it yourself if you'd seen them. But I had no right to do it, I admit, especially as I knew how you needed the money yourself. To help others, one must first have the right to do it. Else, creve chien, si vous n'êtes pas content. Well, that's right, isn't it, Dunya? No, it's not. Bah! You two have ideals. Well, that's praiseworthy, and it's better for you. And if you reach a line, you won't overstep. You might be unhappy, but you won't. That's all nonsense. I only meant to say that I beg your pardon. It's enough, Roger. I'm sure everything you do is very good. Don't be too sure. Yet in their absence, we love them so much. Do, do you know, Roger, that Marfa Petrovna is dead? How do you know of Marfa Petrovna? I mentioned her to... What did she die of? Quite suddenly. It seems that Mr. Svidrigailov... Did Mother write to you about him? Yes. Well, it seems that he was somehow connected with her death. 
They say he beats her dreadfully, but then people will say anything. Are you defending him, Dunia? No. No, he's an awful man. I can imagine no one more awful. What an excellent fellow Razi Mihin is, don't you think, Dunia? Do you like him? Very much. What a pig you are. Where are you off to? I, you I may not to... at all. Stay a while. What's the time? What a pretty watch you have, Dunia. It was a present from Marfa Petrovna. I thought it must be from Lyuzhin. No, he's not given me any presents yet. Uh, and do you remember, Dunia? I was in love and wanted to get married. I remember. <laughs> yes. She was a sickly girl, always dreaming of a nunnery. I really don't know what drew me to her. I think it was because she was always ill. If she'd been lame or hunchback, I'd have loved her better still. Yes, it was a sort of spring delirium. You love her, even now. Her? Oh yes, you ask about her. No, that's all as it were in another world. As is she. What a wretched lodging you have, Roger. It's like a tomb. Now, I'm sure it's half through this place that you've become so melancholy. Yes, I thought that too. Listen, Dunia, of course I beg your pardon for yesterday, but I consider it my duty to tell you again that if you marry Yuzhin, I shall cease at once to look on you as a sister. Roger, you've wholly misunderstood the situation. You seem to imagine that I'm sacrificing myself for someone. Though, of course, I should be glad if I succeeded in being useful to my family. That is not the chief motive for my decision. I am simply marrying for my own sake, because things are hard for me. Why did you smile just now? And why did you blush? You're lying, sister. You can't respect Liu Jin. I met him. You're selling yourself for money. Despicable! How dare you speak to your sister like that? You'll be a legal concubine, and you know it. Glad at least you can blush for it. That's not true. I would not marry him if I were not firmly convinced that I can respect him and that he will respect me. Fortunately, I shall have proof of it this very day. And such a marriage is not a vileness. I'm not committing a murder. If I ruin anyone, it's only myself. What's the matter? Why do you look at me like that? Roger? It's nothing. A little giddiness. What was I saying? Oh, yes. In what way will you get proof today? I've received a letter from Pyotr Petrovich, Roger. I'll show it to you. Strange. Why am I making such a fuss? Marry whom you like. What surprises me is that he is a businessman, a lawyer, yet he writes such a pretentious, uneducated letter. Not they all write like that, you know. Ah, he wishes to meet with you this evening. And what's this? A threat to go away at once, if I am present. That threat is equivalent to a threat to abandon you at once and to abandon you now after summoning you to Petersburg. Well, it all shows the man. Then what is your decision, Roger? What decision? You see that Pyotr Petrovich writes that you are not to be with us this evening and that he will go away if you come. So, will you come? I will do whatever you think best. Will you come? Yes. Dunia. Take my hand. You gave it to me already. Don't you remember? Razi Mihin? Wait on the stairs, Dunya. I'll be with you straight away. Well? Listen, you know that... What's his name? Porfiry Petrovich. I should think so. He's a relation. Why? That case. You mentioned it yesterday. Yeah? Well, it just so happens that I had some pledges with the old woman. Trifles. A ring Dunia gave me and my father's silver watch. They're not worth six rubles together, but they're of sentimental value. I know I ought to have given notice to the police by now, but wouldn't it be better to go straight to Porfiry? What do you think? Certainly to Porfiry. He'll be very, very glad to make your acquaintance. Why, I'll call by and ask him to look in on you today. That'll save you. <laughs> so you knew the old woman, so that's it. He's a nice fellow, brother, you'll see. Rather clumsy. That is, he's a man of polished manners, but clumsy in a different sense. You'll see.
Hey, Romeo. Hey, what? Hey, Romeo. Romeo. Oh, you're like a summer rose. Oh, and how are you washed today? You've cleaned your nose, I declare. Unheard of. How big you are. And how you blush when I asked Dunya if she liked you. By Jove, there he is, blushing again. Big. Not another word, or I will bring you. I didn't expect. Please, come up. I've only come for a moment. Forgive me for disturbing you. I come from Katerina Ivanovna. She begs you to do us the honor of being at the church tomorrow at Mitra Fyanyevsky. And then afterwards, the funeral lunch. She's giving a funeral lunch? Yes, just a little. She told me to thank you very much for helping us yesterday. But for you, we should have had nothing for the funeral. Would you come? I will try. Most certainly. Please, stay a while. I want to talk to you. You are in a hurry, perhaps. But please, be so kind. Why do you look at my room like that? You gave us everything yesterday. However did you find me? You gave your address to Palinka. Palinka? Oh yes, I remember. Why are you standing? Sit down. Tell me, what will happen to you now? Katerina Ivanovna is in consumption, rapid consumption. She will soon die. And the children? What can you do except take them to live with you? I don't know. And what if, even now, while Katerina Ivanovna is alive, you get ill and are taken to hospital? What will happen then? That cannot be. Cannot be? You're insured against it, are you? No. God will not let it be. But perhaps there is no God at all. They all rely on you. Katerina Ivanovna likes to beat you. No, do you say no? You love her then? Love her? Of course. Oh, you don't know. If you only knew. She's like a child. Her mind is quite unhinged, you see, from sorrow. And how clever she used to be. How generous. How kind. Good heavens, beat me. And what if she did? You know nothing, nothing about it. She is so unhappy. She has such faith there must be righteousness everywhere. She expects it. She doesn't see that it's impossible. And how many times I've brought her to tears. Why, only last week I was cruel. You were cruel? Yes. Lizavieta, the peddler, had sold me some cheap, pretty collars and... You knew Lizavieta? Yes. Did you? Go on. Well, I took the collars to show Katerina Ivanovna, and she, she loved them. She put them on and looked at herself in the glass. Will you give them to me, Sonia, she said. And she never asked anyone for anything. And I was sorry to give them. What use are they to you, I said. And she was so grieved. Not for the collars, I saw that. But for my refusing. If only I could take back those words. If only I... It's nothing to you. What are you doing? I did not bow down to you, but to all the suffering of humanity. You're right, though. You are a great sinner, and your worst sin is that you have destroyed and betrayed yourself for nothing. Isn't it fearful? Isn't it fearful that you were living in this filth that you loathe so, and at the same time you know you are not helping anyone by it, not saving anyone from anything? Far better and wiser to leap into the water and end it all. What would become of them? It's incredible. Not one drop of depravity has penetrated your heart. You sit on the edge of the abyss of loathsomeness, 
and refuse to listen when you were told of danger. Doesn't it all mean madness? Or do you expect a miracle? I didn't know that you had only the one room too. Goodbye. I will tell Katerina if I'm not now. Sofia Semyonovna, God give peace to the dead. The living have still to live. That's right, isn't it? Petrovich, how do you do? Delighted to make your acquaintance. I trust you are feeling better? Much. Thank you. Did Razumian explain why I was anxious to see you? He did. Having learned of the murder of Eliana Ivanovna, you wish to ask me to ask the police to inform the lawyer in charge of the case that such and such items belonged originally to you and that you now wish to redeem them. Not redeem? Unfortunately, I'm not quite in funds at present. No matter. I simply wish to confirm that the things are mine. Then when I have money... Of course. Should I note them down to save confusion? Why not? On an ordinary sheet of paper? On the most ordinary sheet of paper. Your things, the ring and the watch, yes, would not in any case be lost, for they were wrapped up together, labelled with your name and the date on which you left them. How observant you are. How can you remember so specifically what belonged to me? I imagine there must have been a great many pledges. Quite easily, I assure you, for you were the only one who has not come forward. I haven't been quite well. I heard that. In fact, I heard you were quite distressed about something. You look pale now. Not at all. I heard delirium. Forgive me, I've been wasting your time. Oh, no, on the contrary. If only you knew how you interest me. <laughs> or perhaps your throat is dry. Shall we call for some tea or something a little more essential? I'm not thirsty. <laughs> As you please. Do you know I read an article of yours? What was it called? Bless me, it was on the tip of my tongue. Oh yes, on crime, something like that. I read it with pleasure two months ago in the periodical review. Periodical? But I sent it to the weekly. Came out in the periodical, didn't you know? I did not. <laughs> it's true. You should try and get some money out of them for it. But how did you know the article was mine? I only signed it with an initial. Ah, uh -huh. I found it out by chance a day or two ago. From the editor, he's a friend of mine. I was very, very interested. I analysed, if I remember, the psychology of a criminal before and after a crime. Quite so. And you maintained that the perpetration of a crime is always accompanied by illness. Very, very original. But what interested me particularly was an idea at the end of the article. Now, um, let me get this right. You stated that all men are divisible into categories of either ordinary or extraordinary. I mean, ordinary men must live in submission, have no right to transgress laws, but extraordinary men now, they have the right to commit any crime they fancy. Isn't that not so? Not exactly. I simply suggested that an extraordinary man has an internal, private right to decide to eliminate certain obstacles for the sake of humanity. Sort of uh, obstacles? Well, uh, if an extraordinary man is forced, say for the sake of an idea, to step over a corpse or wade through blood, he can, I maintain, find within his conscience a sanction for so doing. Indeed. And would you not consider this man a criminal? I would, of course. But then, in my opinion, all great men must, by their very nature, be lawbreakers. Otherwise, it's almost impossible for them to rise above the common rut. Why, Sergius, Solon, Napoleon, and so on, were all, without exception, criminals guilty of terrible carnage. But for the most part, they sought, in different ways, the destruction of the present for the sake of a better future. Fascinating. <laughs> I think you could find yourself rather lonely in your theorising, though. Naturally. Masses would never consider this right. They punish these men, or hang them, 
not a word. And in so doing, they fulfil quite justly their conservative vocation. But the next generation of said masses set these same criminals on pedestals and worship them. Thus, the first category is always the man of the present. The second, the man of the future. The first, preserve the world and people it. The second, move the world forward and lead it to its goal. What goal is that? Each class has an equal right to exist. In fact, all have equal rights with me and vive la guerre eternelle. Till the new Jerusalem, of course. Then you believe in the new Jerusalem? I do. Do you believe in God? Uh, pardon my curiosity. I do. And in Lazarus' is rising from the dead? I... I do. Why do you ask all this? You believe it literally? Literally? You don't say. <laughs> I ask from curiosity, forgive me. But then tell me this. How do you distinguish the extraordinary men from the ordinary ones? <laughs> forgive the natural anxiety of a practical law-abiding citizen, but couldn't they be encouraged to adopt a special uniform or be branded in some way? For you know, if confusion arises and a member of one category imagines he belongs to another, begins to eliminate obstacles... Well, that very often happens. <laughs> You're a clever man. Thank you. But then tell me, please, how many of these extraordinary folk who have the right to kill others? I'm ready to bow down to them, of course, but you must admit it's alarming to think there might be more than a handful. One in a million. And the great geniuses, the rare jewels of humanity, appear on Earth perhaps one in many thousand millions. These real geniuses, the ones who have the right to murder, ought they not to suffer at all for the blood they've shed? Why the word ought? It's not a matter of permission or prohibition. One will suffer if one is sorry for one's victim. Pain and suffering are always inevitable in a large intelligence and deep heart. The really great men must, I think, experience great sadness on earth. Well then, you may abuse me, be angry with me, but I can't resist. There's just one more little notion that I wish to express, simply that I may not forget it. What is it? Well, you see, I really don't know how to express it properly. It's a playful, psychological idea. When you were writing your article, surely you couldn't have helped fancying yourself just a little an extraordinary man, uttering a new word, etc. And if so, could you not bring yourself, in the case of worldly difficulty or some service to humanity, to uh, eliminate obstacle? For instance, to rob and murder? Allow me to assert that I don't consider myself a Napoleon or any personage of that kind. <laughs> Oh, come, don't we all consider ourselves Napoleons now in Russia? <laughs> and not being one, I cannot tell you how I should act. Very well. Do you wish to cross-examine me officially? Why? Oh, no, my dear fellow, you misunderstood me and I knew you would. I have no such intention. You look tired. I have exhausted my welcome. Usually do. Hmm. Well, good day to you for the present. <clears throat> very, very glad of your acquaintance. <laughs> I do. Nastasia! Nastasia! I do. And Lazarus is rising from the dead. Whatever is the matter now? I do. Nastasia. What does God do for you? Feeling better, are you? Can I go now? Wait! Do you have a Bible? Do I have a Bible? Of course I have a Bible, don't you?
I knew you were not asleep, but pretending. Allow me to introduce myself. Arkady Ivanich Svitrikailov. Svitrikailov? Nonsense. It can't be. I assure you it is. I've come to see you for two reasons. Firstly, I wished to make your personal acquaintance, and secondly, I cherish the hope that you will assist me in a matter concerning the welfare of your sister. She arrived yesterday, may I ask? You may not. It was yesterday, I know. I only arrived the day before myself. I hear you've got rid of Marfa Petrovna. Yeah, you heard that, did you? Well, I assure you my conscience is quite at rest on that score. The medical inquiry diagnosed apoplexy due to bathing immediately after a heavy dinner and a bottle of wine. And indeed it could have proved nothing else. I did wonder whether I didn't contribute to her calamity morally, in a way, by irritation of some sort. But then I realised that was out of the question. No wonder you troubled yourself at all about it. What are you laughing at? Only consider, I struck her just twice with a switch. There were no marks. I imagine she was very likely pleased at my warmth. You see, I realised long ago that there are times, or situations rather, in which women are rather glad to be insulted, in spite of all their show of indignation. Are you fond of fighting? No, not very. Barbara Petrovna and I scarcely ever fought. I only used the whip twice in all our seven years. Not counting a fair occasion of a distinctly ambiguous character. No doubt you are missing her very much. Perhaps. Really, perhaps I am. Do you believe in ghosts? Why? Do you? I wouldn't say no, exactly. Have you seen one? Martha Petrovna has been so gracious as to visit me. Were you awake? Every time. She comes, speaks to me for a time, and goes out at the door. Always at the door. You should see a doctor. <laughs> oh, I know I'm not well without your telling me, though I believe I'm five times fitter than you are. What do people generally say? They say you are ill, so whatever appears to you must be only fantasy. And that's not strictly logical. I agree ghosts only appear to the sick, but that doesn't prove they don't exist. That's exactly what it proves. You think? Then what do you say to this argument? Ghosts are, as it were, shreds and fragments of other worlds, the beginnings of them even. A man in hell has, of course, no reason to see them being bound for the sake of completeness and order to live only in this life. But as soon as one is ill, one begins to realize the possibility of another world. And the more seriously ill one is, the closer becomes one's contact with that world, so that as soon as a man dies, he steps straight into it. I thought of that long ago. If you believe in a future life, you could believe that too. I don't believe in a future life. But what if there are only insects there, or something of that sort? What if eternity is just one little room, like a bathhouse in the country? Black. Can you really imagine nothing juster or more comforting than that? <laughs> Perhaps that is just. Whatever it is, it will be what I have made it. Why are you here? Your sister, Avdotya Romanovna, is to be married to Piotr Petrovich Luzhin, yes. Kindly refrain from mentioning my sister. I have come here to speak of her. How can I help it? Oh, very well then, but make haste. I know this, Mr. Lewton. He is no match for your sister. Indeed, I am convinced Abdodia Romanovna is sacrificing herself generously and imprudently for the sake of her family. I fancied from all I had heard of you that you would be very glad if the match could be broken off without the sacrifice of worldly advantages. Now I know you personally. I am convinced of it. All this is very naive. Forgive me. I meant to say impudent on your part. <laughs> You think I have some scheme afoot to suit myself? Don't be uneasy, Rodion Romanich. I assure you, I have no feeling of love now for Avdotya Romanovna, not the slightest. So that I wonder at myself indeed, for I really did feel something. Through idleness and depravity. I certainly am idle and depraved. <laughs> but your sister has such qualities that even I couldn't help being impressed by them. 
But all that's nonsense, as I see myself now. Have you seen it long? <laughs> I still fancied in Moscow that I was coming here to win your sister's hand and cut out misdelusion. But on arriving here and determining on a certain journey, I should like to make some necessary preliminary arrangements. I want to see Avdotya Romanovna through your mediation, and, if you like, in your presence, and explain to her in the first place that she can never gain anything but harm from this delusion. Then, begging her pardon for all past unpleasantness, to make her a present of ten thousand roubles, and so assist in the severance from this delusion. You are certainly mad. How dare you speak like that? I knew you would scream at me, but my conscience is perfectly clear. I make the offer with no ulterior motive. You may not believe me, but in the end, you and Abdothya Romanovna will know. The point is, I did actually cause your sister, whom I greatly respect, some trouble and unpleasantness, and so, sincerely regretting it, I want simply to do something to her advantage. In conclusion, let me say that in marrying Miss Delusion, she is taking money just the same, only from another man. Don't be angry, Rodion Romanich. Think it over coolly and quietly. I beg you to say no more. In any case, this is unpardonable impertinence. Not in the least. Then a man may do nothing but harm to his neighbour, and is prevented through trivial, conventional formalities from doing the tiniest bit of good. That's absurd. If I died, for instance, and left that sum to your sister in my will, she would surely not refuse it? She very surely would. Yet ten thousand roubles is a capital thing to have in any case. Hmm. Well, anyway, I beg you to repeat what I have said to Abdotya Romanovna. Nope. Then I shall be obliged to try to see her myself, and worry her by so doing. And if I do tell her, won't you try to see her anyway? I don't know what to say. I should very much like to see her once more. Don't hope for it. Will you be leaving soon? On your travels? What travels? The journey you spoke of. The journey? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, I did mention a journey. Well, that's a very wide subject. If only you knew what you were asking. Perhaps I shall get married instead of a journey. They're making a match for me. Here? Yes. Yeah. But I am very anxious to see Abdotya Romanovna. I earnestly beg of you. Oh, yes, I've forgotten something. Tell your sister, Radion Romanich, that Marfa Petrovna left her 3,000 roubles in her will. It was absolutely certain. It was arranged in my presence a week before her death. I thought your Romanovna should have the money in two or three weeks. Are you telling the truth? Well, your servant. I'm staying very near you. We shall be friends, I hope. offer you some refreshment, Pyotr Petrovich, but... Quite, quite so. I trust you have had a favourable journey. Oh, very. I'm gratified to hear it. You are not over fatigued, then? I'm young and strong. I don't get tired. Our national railways are of terrible length. Mother Russia, as they say, is a vast country. <laughs> In spite of my fervour to do so, I, I was unable to meet you yesterday, but I trust all passed off without inconvenience. <clears throat> I expect you have heard that Marfa Petrovna is dead. <laughs> to be sure, I had heard so too. In fact, I must regrettably make you acquainted with the fact that Arkady Ivanich Svidrigailov set off in haste for Petersburg directly after his wife's funeral. Here. 
I do not imagine you have any grounds for uneasiness, Avdotya Romanovna, unless, of course, you are yourself desirous of getting into communication with him. I have no desire to get into communication with him, nor am I uneasy in the slightest. No doubt, here in Petersburg, if he has any pecuniary resources, he will lapse at once into his old ways. He is the most depraved, abjectly vicious specimen of that class of men. In fact, I have considerable reason to believe that Marfa Petrovna, who was... So unfortunate as to fall in love with him and pay his debts eight years ago was also of service to him in another way. Solely by her exertions, a criminal charge, for which he might well have been sentenced to Siberia, involving an element of homicidal brutality, was hushed up. That's the sort of man he is, if you care to know. I'm well aware of the sort of man he is, but I trust you have reasonable evidence to support what you're saying to me. I only repeat what I was told in secret by Martha Petrovna herself. I must observe that, uh, from a legal point of view at least, the case is far from clear. Apparently there was a woman called Restley, with whom Svidrigailov had close and mysterious relations. She had a dependent. Niece, I believe it was. Living with her. A deaf and dumb girl, no more than fourteen. One day the child was found hanging in the garret. The inquest, the verdict was suicide, so under the usual proceedings the matter ended. But later on, information was given that the child had been cruelly outraged by Svidrigailov. Thanks to Martha Petrovna's money and exertions, however, he never went beyond gossip. Nevertheless, the story is a significant one. Pyotr Petrovich, I must beg you to say no more of Mr. Svidrigailov. It makes me miserable. He's just been to see me. He seemed quite cheerful and hopes that we should become friends. He is particularly anxious, by the way, Dunia, for an interview with you. He has a proposition to make to you. He told me, too, that a week before her death, Marfa Petrovna left you 3,000 rubles in her will and that you shall receive the money very shortly. Is that a fact? What did he want to propose to Avdotya Romanovna? Did he tell you? Yes. I am compelled to keep a business engagement, so I shall not be in your way. Don't go, Pyotr Petrovich. You intended to spend the evening. Precisely so, Avdotya Romanovna. But as your brother cannot speak openly in my presence, I have no desire to speak openly before him. Moreover, my most urgent and weighty request has been disregarded. I refer to your request that my brother should not be present at our meeting. This was disregarded solely at my insistence. You wrote that you have been insulted by my brother. I think this must be explained at once and you must be reconciled. There are insults, Avdotya Romanovna, that no good will can make us forget. There is a line in everything that it is dangerous to overstep. And once it has been overstepped, there can be no return. Fyodor Petrovich, please understand that our whole future depends now on all this being explained and set right as soon as possible. If you have the least regard for me, all this business must be ended today. However hard that may be. I'm surprised that you're putting the matter like that. <laughs> Esteeming and, uh, so to say, adoring you, I may at the same time very well be able to dislike some member of your family. Though I lay claim to the happiness of your hand, I cannot accept duties incompatible with... Don't be so ready with... to take offence, Pyotr Petrovich, and be the sensible and generous man I have always considered you to be. I have given you a great promise. I am your betrothed. Understand that if you are not reconciled, then I must choose between you. And I don't wish to be mistaken in my choice. I wish to know for certain now whether he is a brother to me. And whether I am dear to you. Whether you esteem me. Whether you are the husband for me. Does your man of no your words are deeply offensive in view of the position I have the honour of occupying in relation to you. To say nothing of your setting me upon a level with an insolent boy. You have broken your promise to me. And I will not let this pass in view of the obligations existing between us. What? I have set your interest beside all that has hitherto been most precious in my life, what has made up the whole of my life. And here you are, offended at my taking too little account of you. Love for your husband should outweigh your love for your brother. Your brother insulted me by misrepresenting the idea that I had expressed to you and your mother in a private conversation that marriage with a poor girl who has had experience of trouble is more advantageous from a conjugal point of view than with one who has lived in luxury. 
Your brother intentionally exaggerated the significance of my words and made them ridiculous, accusing me of malicious intent. And as far as I can tell, he relied upon your mother's correspondence to do so. Kindly let me know in what terms precisely your mother repeated my words in her letter to Rajan Ramanich. I've no idea. I'm sure my mother repeated them as she understood them. I'm not sure how Roddy repeated them to you. Perhaps he exaggerated? He could only have done so at her instigation. Yotra Petrovich, the proof that Mother and I did not take your words in a very bad sense is the fact that I am here. So this is my fault again. I will withdraw, that I may not hinder the pleasures of family intimacy and the discussion of secrets. But in withdrawing, may I venture to request that for the future I may be spared similar meetings and, so to say, compromises? Tell me, Pyotr Petrovich, am I to consider every desire of yours a command? I have given up everything for you, and have come here relying on you. <laughs> that is not quite true. Especially at the present moment, when the news has come of Marfa Petrovna's legacy, which indeed seems very apropos given the new tone you take with me. Judging from that remark, we may certainly presume that you were reckoning on my helplessness. Now, in any case, I cannot reckon on it. When I think of the trouble I have taken and the base, base ingratitude to which I have been subjected, I have put myself out for you. Well, now I am rewarded for my efforts. Oh, yeah. Indeed, now I am rewarded. Are you not ashamed now, sister? I am ashamed, brother. Pyotr Petrovich, go away. I've got your man him now. If I go out of this door now, I will never come back again. Consider what you are doing. My word is not to be shaken. What insolence! I don't want you to come back again. So that's how it stands. So that's how it stands. But do you know, Abdottir Romanovna, that I might protest? And what might you protest about? What rights have you? You have bound me by your promise, and now you deny it! Besides, I've been led on account of that into expenses. <laughs> expenses? What expenses? Are you speaking of my trunk? Why, the conductor brought it for you for nothing! Mercy on us. I have bound you? What are you thinking, Pyotr Petrovich? It was you bound me, hand and foot, not I. Pyotr Petrovich, do be kind and go. I am going. But one last word. You seem to have forgotten entirely that I made up my mind to take you, so to speak, when the gossip of the town had spread to the entire district regarding your reputation. Well, my eyes have now been opened. I see myself that I may have acted very, very recklessly in disregarding the universal verdict that you are a rampant whore! You are a mean and spiteful man! Not a word. Not a gesture. Kindly leave the room, and not a word more. I had no idea that he was such a base man. If I had seen through him before, nothing would have tempted me. What did Mr. Svidrigailov say to you? He wants to make you a present of 10,000 rubles, and desires to see you once in my company. What answer did you give him? At first I said I wouldn't take any message to you. Then he said that he would do his utmost to see you without my help. He assured me that his passion for you was over, still. He doesn't want you to marry Lusion. How did he strike you? Odd. He's got some terrible plan, I know. Where are you going? Oh, I'm quite obliged. I mean to say, Dunya, I think it would be better for us to part for a time. I feel ill. I'm not at peace. I remember you and love you. But leave. Leave me alone. Whatever happens to me, whether I come to ruin or not, I am absolutely resolved. Forget me. Don't inquire about me. When I can, I will send for you. Perhaps. But for now, if you love me, give me up, else I shall begin to hate you. I feel it. Goodbye. Brother, what are you doing? Once and for all, do not ask me any questions. I have nothing to tell you. 
Don't come to see me. I will send you as you meet him. Roger. I don't venture to judge you. But if you should need all my life or anything, call me and I'll come. Razumihin is a very good fellow. Well? He is competent, hardworking, honest, and capable of real love. Goodbye, Dunia. Dr. Romanovna. Russians in general are broad in their ideas, broad like their land, and exceedingly disposed to the fantastic, the chaotic. But it is a misfortune to be broad without a special genius. Do you remember what a lot of talk we had together on that subject, sitting on the terrace after supper? Why, you used to reproach me with breath. I was so happy as to interest you in my opinions. You're very pale, Dr. Romanovna. How did you find me? <laughs> I followed Roger, of course. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> Give it to me at once. Have oh, your energy, my dear, Dr. Romanovna. You're exerting yourself, aren't you? Open the door at once. At once, face man. This is an outrage. Now, oh, Dr. Romanovna, do you know how difficult it is to prove an assault? The police, the paperwork, the gossip mongers with their envious little statements, it's also very tedious. I'd only need some plain face of a madam to swear you led me on. In fact, I know just the girl, the common enough. You see, I wish to spare you, Avdotya Romanovna. Violence is so very, very messy, and for my part, I'd really rather not force the issue. We men are made a good deal stronger, you know. It's so in the shoulders here. I'd really, truly hate to hurt you. Submit to me now, and rest assured your conscience will be as clear as if you had fought, bitten, scratched to no avail. You'd simply be submitting to circumstances. Preventing a violence that I'm certain would be hateful to both of us. That completely alters the aspect of affairs. <laughs> You've made things wonderfully easy for me, Dr. Romanovna. <laughs> Where did you get the gun? Why? It's my little pistol. An old friend. How I'd hunted for it. It's not your pistol. It belonged to Marfa Petrovna, whom you killed, wretch. Nothing in her house belonged to you. I took it when I began to suspect what you were capable of. If you dare to advance one step, I swear I'll kill you. You poisoned your wife. I know. You are a murderer yourself. Are you so certain I poisoned Martha Patrol? You did. You hinted it yourself. You talked to me of poison. I know you had it in readiness. You went to get it. It was your doing. It must have been your doing, you bastard. Even if that were true, it would have been for your sake. You would have been the cause. You're lying! I hated you always! Always! Dr. Romanovna, you seem to have forgotten how you softened to be in the heat of propaganda. 
I saw it in your eyes. Remember that moonlit night when the nightingale was singing. That's a lie. A lie and a libel. A lie? Well, if you like, it was a lie. I made it up. Women ought not to be reminded of such things. I know you will shoot him out of my head. Well, shoot away. <laughs> the wasp has stung me! <laughs> she went straight at my head. What's this? Blood? <laughs> well, you missed. Fire again, I'll wait. If you go on like that, I shall have time to seize you before you cock again. <laughs> I swear I'll shoot again. I'll, I'll kill you. Well, at three paces, you can hardly help it. But if you don't... Oh, you haven't loaded it properly. Oh, mind you, you have another charge there. Look, get it ready. I'll wait. <laughs> Make haste! Make haste!
company you are at last, confound you. I've been to your sister's lodging. She's not there. Where is she? What happened this evening with Lujin? Try the cat here. What? That's where she'll be, I'll wager. What do you mean? We're drawn to water, she and I. Try bank, romantic. <laughs> Alone or with Lujin? Oh, what you... Oh. Listen, as far as I'm concerned, you may go to hell. There is some mystery, I know. Some secret that I don't intend to worry my head about. I've simply come to swear at you to relieve my feelings. Now I'm going to drink. How do you know? It's pretty obvious. You're right. I shall drink. Goodbye. I was talking with my sister. I think it was about you, Razumihin. What did you say? I told her that you were a very good, honest, industrious man. I didn't say that you love her, because she knows that herself. She does. Whatever happens to me, wherever I go, you will look after her, Razumihin. I give her to your keeping. I say this because I know quite well how you love her, and I'm convinced of the purity of your heart. I know that she too may love you. Perhaps already does. She's broken with illusion. Now decide for yourself whether you need go drinking or not. <laughs> you see, well... Damn it, you're a capital fellow. A capital fellow. Where do you intend to go? Of course, if it's a secret, never mind. But I'm sure it must be some ridiculous nonsense and you've made it all up. Leave it to time. You'll know it all in time. Very well. Goodbye, Roger. <laughs> you know, there was a time, brother, when... Oh, never mind. You see, there was a time when... Well... <laughs> Goodbye. I'm not going to drink. There's no need now. The canal, you said. He's a political conspirator. He must be. And he's on the eve of some desperate step. And... Don't you know? Oh, by the way, you remember that murder? <coughs> Poor Furious with the old woman. Well, the murderer has come forward. He's confessed, given proofs. It, it was one of the workmen, Nikolai, the painter. Only fancy. <laughs> and I almost thought... Heavens, what I thought. A fine idea on my part. Where did you hear that? From Porphyria, among others. <laughs> he gave me a capital explanation of it. <laughs> Psychological, after his fashion. Porphyria? <laughs> he explained it, explained it himself. <laughs> I'll tell you all about it sometime. But for now, farewell. <laughs> what need have I of drink? You have made me drunk without wine. I am drunk, Roger! Goodbye. I'll come again soon. So Porfiri has explained it all. Explained it psychologically. And to think that even Razumihin had begun to suspect. But what is Porfiri's object in putting Razumihin off with Nikolai? He must have some plan, some design. But what is it? Expect a visitor, Radyan Ramanich. I was passing, and I thought, why not? Let you look your door. Well, I've come to have it out with you, my dear fellow. I have perhaps acted unfairly towards you, I feel it. So I've decided that openness is better between us. What do you mean? I'm not a monster, Radyan Ramanich. I can understand what it must mean to be a man who has been unfortunate, who is proud, imperious, and above all, impatient. I regard you, in any case, as a man of noble character, and not without elements of generosity. I wanted to tell you this first, frankly. For above all, I don't want to deceive you. 
It's scarcely necessary to go over every detail. The old woman's notes on the pledges all came to nothing, but your article in that journal. <laughs> I ask you, how could I help getting carried away? I read it thinking, that man will not go the ordinary way. <laughs> it's not malicious, I assure you. <laughs> Do you suppose I didn't come to search your room? I did, I did. And to think of your blurting out, what if I murdered her to my ingenuous friend, Mr. Razumikhin? <laughs> it was too daring, too reckless. And that stone, that stone under which her things were hidden. And your illness, semi-delirium. No, Rajana Manus, this is a fantastic, gloomy business. A modern case where the heart of man is troubled. Where the phrase is quoted that blood renews, where comfort is preached as the aim of life. Here we see bookish dreams and a heart unhinged by theories. Here we have resolution in the first stage, a resolution of a special kind. He resolved to do it by jumping off a precipice or from a bell tower. In his next shock, as he went to the crime, he forgot to shut the door behind him and murdered two people for his theory. He committed the murder but forgot to take the money. What he did snatch up and hid under his stone. He is a murderer. He looks upon himself as an honest man, despises others, hoses his injured <laughs> No, do you? It's not the work of our little confessor. That's not the work of a Nikolai. Who then? It's the murderer. Who? Oh. What you want to know? You were the murderer? Yep, lower lip is twitching. You misunderstood me, I think. That's why you're so surprised. I did not murder her. It was you, Rajendra Manoj. If you consider me guilty, why don't you arrest me? Because I have a genuine liking for you, believe it or not. So I've come to see you with a direct and open proposition. That you should surrender and confess. It will be infinitely more to your advantage, and to mine too, for my task will be done. You have nothing but conjecture to go on. What if you're mistaken? No, General Manager, I am not mistaken. I have a little fact even then that Providence has sent me. What little fact? Ah, oh, now that I won't tell you. But in any case, I haven't the right to put it off much longer. I must arrest you soon. If I were guilty, which I don't admit, what reason should I have to confess? How can you even ask? It would lessen your sentence. You would be confessing at the moment when another man has taken the crime upon himself and muddled the whole case. I don't care about lessening the sentence. Oh, but you unmanaged. Do not disdain life. Are you afraid of the great expiation before you? Surely you cannot be. You made up a theory and were ashamed when it broke down and turned out to be not at all original. At least you didn't deceive yourself for long. You went straight to the furthest point in one bound. But having taken such a step, you must harden your heart. There's justice in it. You must feel that. When do you mean to arrest me? I can let you walk about another day or two. And what if I run away? You won't. You've ceased to believe in your theory already. What we run away with? No, I am convinced you will decide to take your suffering. The suffering that Yonra managed is a great thing. Porfiry Petrovich, please don't convince yourself that I confess to you today. I have listened through simple curiosity, nothing more. And I have admitted nothing. Remember that. Oh, yes, of course. I'll remember. Look at him, he's trembling. Don't be uneasy, my dear fellow. Have it your way. I have one more request to make of you. It's an awkward one, but important. If anything should happen, you were taken with the notion of putting an end to the business in some fantastic fashion. Do please write a brief but precise note, only two lines, and uh, mention the stone. It would be most generous. Come. Till we meet again. Good thoughts and sound decisions to you.
Wait. Who's there? It's you. It's late. It's eleven, isn't it? Katrina Ivanov knows. for the best. And the children? They're asleep. Palinka will watch them. My neighbour. Yes? My neighbour has taken it upon himself to make all the necessary arrangements. I just thought. I did not like him at first. He will pay. He will send the children to a good orphanage at his own expense and give each of them 15,000 rubles on their coming of age. And what was his motive for such benevolence, I wonder? I couldn't believe it either. I asked him. He said it was done from humanity. <laughs> he said he knew you. He said you were his friend. I? Tell Avdotya Romanovna that this is how I'm spending her 10,000, he said. Svidrigailov. Do you pray to God a great deal, Sonia? What should I be without God? But what does God do for you? Be silent. Don't ask. You don't deserve. That's it. That's it. That's the only explanation. She's a religious maniac. She does everything. Where is the story of Lazarus? Where is the raising of Lazarus? Find it for me, Sonia. You're looking in the right place. It's in the fourth gospel. Thank you. I have abandoned my family today. What? I have only you now. You too have transgressed. You have destroyed a life. Your own. It's all the same and you won't be able to stand it either. And if you remain alone like me, you'll go out of your mind. So we must go together on the same road. Come, let us go. What for? Because you can't remain like this, that's what. You must look things straight in the face at last, and not weep like a child and cry that God won't allow it. Break what must be broken once and for all, and take the suffering on oneself. Freedom and power, and above all power, over all trembling creation and the ante. That's the goal, remember that? I know who killed Elizabetta. How do you? I know. Have they found him? No. Then how do you know? Guess. Why do you frighten me like this? I must be a great friend of his, since I know. He didn't mean to kill Elizabetta. It was an accident. He went there to kill the old woman when she was alone. But Elizabetta came in and so he killed her too. You can't guess. Take a good look. Oh, good God. Stop, Sonia, enough, don't. What have you done to yourself? Oh, you're a strange girl, Sonia. You kiss me and hug me when I tell you such. You don't know what you were doing. There is no one. No one in the whole world now is so unhappy as you. And you won't leave me, Sonia. No. No, never. I'll follow you. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, good God, together. Together. I'll follow you to Siberia. Perhaps I don't want to go to Siberia yet, Sonia. How could you bring yourself to do it? A man like you. How could you give away your last kopeck and yet rob and murder? What can I say? I have a bad heart, Sonia. Make note of it. I'm a coward and a vain wretch. Envious, malicious, base, just like all the other louses. But never mind, that's not the point. I must speak now, but I don't know how to begin. I wanted to become a Napoleon. That's why I killed her. Do you understand? I... I wanted to have the daring. Power is only vouchsafed to the man who dares to stoop and pick it up. I only wanted to have the daring Sonia. That's why I killed her. I only killed a louse Sonia. 
a useless, loathsome, harmful creature. A human being, a louse. You have turned away from God, and God has smote you, has given you over to the devil. And the devil mocks me! Listen, when I went then to the old woman's, I only went to try, you may be sure of that. You murdered her. But how did I murder her? Is that how men do murders? I murdered myself, not her. I crushed myself forever. Oh, enough, enough, Sonia. Let me be, let me be. Well, what am I to do now? What are you to do? Go, at once. Stand at the crossroads. Bow down. First kiss the earth you have defiled, and then bow down to all the world, and say to all men aloud, I am a murderer. Then God will send you life again. Will you go? Will you go? You mean Siberia. I must give myself up. Suffer and expiate your sin by it. That is what you must do. Sin? What sin? I killed a vile, noxious insect. A cruel old pawnbroker of no use to anyone. Killing her should atone for forty sins. But you have shed blood. Which all men shed. Which flows and has always flowed in streams. Which is spilt like champagne. And for which men are crowned in the capital and called the benefactors of mankind. If I had succeeded, I might have been wreathed with glory. Instead, I'm trapped. Have you a cross on you? No, of course not. Here, take this one. It belonged to Lizavieta. Take it. Is this the symbol of my taking out the cross? As though I hadn't suffered much till now. Well, what are you crying for? Stop, leave off. Oh, how I hate you all! What am I to you? Push yourself. Say at least one prayer. Oh, certainly. As much as you like. Sincerely, Sonia. Sincerely. Svitrikailov. <laughs> Svitrikailov has shot himself. I haven't faith. I haven't. I thought of drowning myself, but I was afraid. Not so. If I'm guilty, I cannot be forgiven. How can I be honest and manly all my life if I am a murderer? I am a murderer. I am a murderer. It was I who killed the old pawnbroker woman and her sister Elizabeth with an axe and rob them. I am. Whatever I choose to be, whatever I focus on, in any given moment, Whatever I focus on.